Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and with me are Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner, still in completely different locations, but maybe there's some light at the end of this pandemic tunnel. We'll be able to actually get together in person at some point this year. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Our subject today is quintets and any kind of quintet is allowed. It just has to be for five instruments and hopefully be called a quintet or maybe not. And our special guest is someone who spent eight years as a member of a quartet, one of the UK's most popular, the Brodskys, where he often collaborated with a wide range of musicians, including famously Elvis Costello, Paul McCartney and Sophie von Otter and Björk, amongst others. Since then, he's been leader of the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the Philharmonia and guest led all the other major orchestras of the UK and others around the world. Now he's pretty much as far around the world from here as you can get the leader of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra in Australia. He is the violinist Andrew Haveron. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this. Lovely to see you. Uh, it's a great the, pleasure. Thank you for having me. The wonders of technology that there you are, <laughs> thousands and thousands of miles away. Maybe I should start by asking you what it was that first attracted you to the beautiful climate, laid back lifestyle and sparsely populated <laughs> Australia. <laughs> um, uh, the work ethic. <laughs> no, I think you've, you've, you've pretty much uh... You've nailed all the all the all the side benefits of of, of Australia, but uh, it's a fabulous orchestra. Um, my office is mostly the Sydney Opera House. Um, it's currently wow. closed, of course, for mm. renovations, but haven't been in it for well over a year. But um, but you have been busy, yeah. haven't you? Because Australia oh, is sort of open in that regard. I, I feel guilty almost for mentioning it to you, <laughs> but uh, we have been back to our normal uh, season. Uh, our seasons, of course, start here in what well, they are calendar years. So, you know, our yeah. season starts January, February. So we are well into our 21 season. Um, and uh, yes, three or four weeks in, we've been playing symphonies to sold out audiences. Uh, we're only at 75% of uh, Sydney Town Hall currently. Uh, we're only allowed that, but um, uh, hopefully that will be, uh, uh, re you know, we'll, we'll have capacity soon we're not quite sure when but uh, people are very careful here and it it, it works um yeah. i know you uh you, i know you listen to uh this podcast uh quite I regularly do. yes and i i gather didn't you say uh that you you played a number of the earworms that we were mentioning I did. a few weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> well last week um I was directing a, a concert. I have a, a, a far busier year than, than normal because, of course, all of our uh, international uh, soloists and conductors aren't available. So I am directing many more programs than I would do otherwise. So last week was uh, an entire concert of Bach, um, a symphony orchestra playing Bach. I mean, a small mm. version of us, of course. Um, but we had the badinery, the air on the G string, or you know the, what it's actually called, and and the, the double concerto. I, I wasn't sure if that was one of the earworms. I don't think it was. No, but I don't think I that was. was uh, you know, it, it just felt um, most of what we've played so far this year was mentioned on that one podcast, which <laughs> 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 you wow. know, keeping people happy with some some popular repertoire. Absolutely. Now I mentioned obviously you were you member of the Brodskys, uh, well known as a quartet player, but you. I'm sure I've spent quite a lot of time playing quintets in your career. Indeed. Yes. Um, so I uh, had a, a good hard think about your contentious question, top five quintets, which I, I know you like to provoke every, your, everyone with, uh, you know, what does it mean? How do we interpret it? And what does, uh, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, find the top five? Uh, and I've, I don't think I've chosen what I think are the top five best pieces of music, but I've had a good hard think about what is a quintet. When you've been in a quartet for so long and you're you, you're used to the, the sort of the ground rules of, of uh, or the, 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 the basics, you know, um, trios, quartets as, a, as the basis of chamber music. What does that extra person, the fifth person, what does what do they bring to the score, to the musical experience? And, and so on. Now, clearly, there are going to be a few quintets that we all, I assume, agree on, and um, we will be talking about. Um, the Bible and Shakespeare's as well. The Bible and Shakespeare ones, yeah. exactly. Um, so maybe we'll leave those till later. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, as, a, as an example of uh, what I mean by what is a quintet and what does, you know, the, the, the five, um, what, does it, what does it mean? I'm going to start talking about piano quintets, if that's all right, mm -hmm. because... I don't think that's a quintet at all. 
<laughs> I think it's a string quartet, one string quartet and one pianist. That's a duo. That's in my opinion, <laughs> or a small orchestra playing the tutti and a solo piano. You know, um, so you know, I of course I love all of the you know the great piano quintets. I'm 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 not against them. I I I I I just I just don't like playing them very much. Um, a string quartet doesn't play in unison nearly as much. As if you're playing, as when you're playing a piano quintet, you know, uh, the Dvorak, the Brahms, you, the four of you have to play in unison all the time because you're just a tutti, really. There's a, there's a big, you know, crashing piano part and you're sort of, you know, swamping. Of course, look, it's, the audiences love them. Uh, I love them. I mean, the tune, the melodies are great. Brahms uh, is, is, I would say the, 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 the best of the three big romantic ones that, if, you know, that would immediately come to mind, Brahms, Dvorak, Schumann. Um, they're also the sort of pieces that get thrown together at festivals and, and performed with very little rehearsal or sense of mm -hmm. cohesion or understanding of chamber music, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, that comes. Look, I'm going to be honest straight away with this. I'm coming at this as a violinist, as a string player, as a performer, um, mm -hmm. not as a listener. Not you know. Uh, so that, that, that's what I'm, I'm. I'm aware that these are very biased opinions, and I, I, I hope that's what you want from me. Absolutely. Um, we love. I'm biased not going opinions. to mention brass quintets or percussion quintets or whatever <laughs> because i hope they're covered here on, in the room um so yes uh some people many people on social media agreed with me as it happens that my favorite of the big romantic piano quintets would be the elgar quintet hmm. um it it's just a bit different to all the others and it's not often played and um it has it, it for me it, it it ticks so many boxes it does feel like a quintet it does have moments of or put it this way everybody gets uh, a moment in the limelight uh, a little bit more less of that sort of big tutti feel or if there is a tutti feel to it um it's where it's somehow the the textures are clearer maybe it's just i simply haven't played it nearly as much as i want to so i still you know have a hankering to perform it um uh a close runner-up, if if I'm allowed to talk in categories, and I'm sticking with piano quintets, would be the César Franck and the Schnitke, because they are just texturally more, slightly more interesting to play. So, from your point of view, it's really a mm. failure of of the composers to see the quartet as four players. You, you're saying that not enough composers have have utilized the single players that are in that. Well, unit. I suppose I just don't feel like it's ever five equal parts with a with a with a piano. <clears throat> for example, the one of my favorite pieces of of chamber music to play is the the Korngold Suite for two violins, cello and piano left hand. Now that's a quartet because the, the <laughs> pianist is only using one hand <laughs> and everybody gets an equal part. Now that is a quartet. So a piano quintet is already a sextet, if you ask me. You know, there, there are two, you know, two hands to compete with. Um, but it's just, yeah, uh, the, the textures of it, the, the, how it feels to play. It's, it's a them and us situation if you're a string player, you know, and the, <laughs> the, the lid's fully open. Your ears are going to be ringing by the end of it you know but it's going to be fun and the Dvorak is fabulous and you you know you all want to join in with a hope let's have an offstage choir as well at the end you know i don't know um, <laughs> well richard you were nodding a lot through that and i and actually i was i was imagining you were going to choose the elgar as well um it's i i i don't even got one um piano quintet on my sort of final list really and that was a cesar franc one because mm. uh, i just love cesar franc i think he's underrated i think that is one hell of a piece that is does not get appreciated or played enough it is volcanic you know this is a great torrent of chromatic passion pouring out of the end of the 19th century and what, what andrew's saying about the piano quintet that really really strikes a chord i mean i i came my chain of music experience has been absolutely overwhelmingly as an amateur player getting friends together for many years we had a regular string quintet with two violas um which met every week um i, I played a lot of the repertoire um, as an amateur string player finding a pianist an amateur pianist who is good enough to play these parts and is also capable of showing the self-restraint required to play chamber music is you know it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and if you've got an amateur pianist who's that good they just romp away they pull things about they stop they go back they don't even realize they're doing it because they're so used to playing on their own and it's, it's usually a nightmare um I, I, the only time i've ever really satisfactorily got to play a piano quintet was when i was playing with as a sort of quasi-professional um with a professional pianist and that was that was a 
Sri Lankan lady called Melanie Jai Singh Pierce, when we played played the Schumann Quintet to a packed ballroom at a hotel in Colombo. It was a very weird experience, but, but a good one. But no, the, the Frank, what, what you say is, I mean, it, the, the interesting thing is if we're talking about string quintets, it, it, it's, Mozart is a founder of that genre. It's essentially a classical genre, like the string quartets. It's about dialogue. It's about finding a balance. Um, I read an article once by Robin Holloway, I think when Thomas Adairs wrote his piano quintet, in which he described the piano quintet as an extravagant, romantic, fantastical beast. It's it's a romantic thing. It only happen. It's all about the, you know, the opulence, extravagance, the grandeur, the sort of poetry, the sort of, you know, the, the great romantic excess of piano um, doing that adversarial thing, almost like a mini concerto quite often. Um, I think it's interesting with Andrew Chosey Elgar quintet, because there you've got a composer who doesn't really think primarily in terms of the piano, never really did. Not that he couldn't write for it, not no. that he wasn't himself a pianist. Mm. But he, he, I think Elgar always thought in terms of instrumental colour and instrumental character. I think that really shows in the piano, his piano quintet. You think about that opening, um, in which he's really using the colours of the, of the the different colours and characters of the instruments, the muted strings against that sort of fragmented piano part. He really is trying to make a difference there and really making something with that. And yeah. Brahms, um, Vorjak, which I adore, I, I love the generosity of Vorjak and how, how extravagant he is with his melodies and how glorious those melodies are. I love the Cezor Frank, as I've said, because it's just over the top. That's a symphony with a piano obbligato for strings and piano really um the brahms brahms is not quite so much my thing but it's a hugely impressive work but in any case all these things really have that sort of adversarial element it's a piano with this sort of strings struggling to keep on hang on somewhere in the background really and um that's part of the thrill that's part of the excitement but i as a player certainly as a string player i I don't really think of it as, as chamber music well enough i think one one of my choices is going to be the shostakovich piano quintet which I love. I have a story about it, which I'll tell later. But, mm-hmm. but actually, um, I think one of the reasons I really like it, I mean, particularly like in the scherzo, the famous scherzo, uh, which is about as Shostakovich a movement as you can possibly get. Um, that I rather like the fact that the strings are they're much more rhythmic in in that sense than the rhythmic backing, if you like, for the for the melody that's on the piano. And I rather like that that sound. I think that's rather it's, it's sometimes a slightly coarse very rhythmic sound that, that we that we know from uh, a lot of string writing from Shostakovich. But I, for me, that works really, really, really well. Uh, Charlotte, that was one of yours, was it, the Shostakovich? Yeah, that was one of mine. And funnily enough, I mean, it's actually the scherzo that um, that's my most boring part of the whole quintet. Um, I actually, I, I take issue with Andrew. I would say the Shostakovich is an example of where everybody is actually given their place. And funnily enough, it starts with a prelude and fugue, which is a pianistic um, Baroque form. And what he does with it is so democratic for all instruments. I mean, even Rachmaninoff, the pianist composer, described this fugue as incredibly original. But um, even there, it's it's for all instruments. Um, so, But yes, it's funny, the, the scherzo, um, to me, is just another Shostakovich scherzo, frankly. I mean, we, we know what he does. He's sarcastic, he's ironic, um, and that's that. Yeah, but it's if you good, look though. in the other part, <laughs> yeah, it's good, but I mean, you get it elsewhere, don't you? Whereas, for me, the absolute emotional crux of the Shostakovich quintet is the fugue. Um, is, is there anything more heart-rending and devastating in its fragility, this one by one they come in it's so quiet and fragile when it's played well um and then this bleak climax and then coming down again um uh, the first time i absolutely fell in love with it head over heels it's really funny i mean this this soviet piece um from 1940 and and it was a group of um arab and jewish israelis in a tuscan palazzo um in a rehearsal and so when i hear this piece I actually think of sun and warmth and people from two quite divided communities coming together and playing this piece it's a very emotional memory for me and then the other reason I chose it is this wonderful link with Marlowe which you just don't associate with Shostakovich at all but the passage between the intermezzo and the finale you suddenly have these rocking chords and you're in Vienna it's Marlowe world and then you you go straight up to Mahler full, you know, you're in a Viennese ballroom for the final. Um, so I think it's the most surprising and original and democratic piano quintet, actually, certainly of all the ones that I've chosen, but I think in general it's it's an absolute winner. Yeah, I, I think it's a masterpiece. They, 
I, we had a wonderful moment when I was at school. It used to be that that uh, sketch used to sort of be like our theme tune. We loved it. We, we all of us in the music uh, room, we we loved that. We used to sing along to it and everything. We loved it, and particularly the which was still my recording, which is the Borodin Quartet and uh, Richter on uh, piano. It's a fabulous recording. And um, what happened, which was extraordinary, and it's one of those moments you sort of dream of, is that then we we all sat our A levels, our A level music, and as everyone who did A-levels around that time, I mean, I have no idea whether they still do this. They would play a piece that you didn't know was coming and you had to comment on it uh, and talk about it uh, in style and perhaps place it somewhere um, date-wise and and maybe have a, a stab at the composer. And would you believe it? It was the scherzo from the Shostakovich Quintet. And uh, we all we all looked at each other and started laughing, which, of course, doesn't always look that good to the invigilator of a serious exam. But um, we at the end, we were I've, I've never been more buzzy after taking an exam, I have to say, because we were so excited because we knew exactly what it was. We knew when it was written, who it was. We knew everything about it. So we were all heads down, scribbling away, <laughs> writing about this piece. It's just one of those wonderful moments, you know, like in my grade two piano, when the bit of music they gave you for, for um, sight reading, I'd studied before. You know, it's one of those little moments sometimes, you just think someone is watching over me at this particular moment. Thank you very much. <laughs> but no, great, great piece. Um, let's have another one from, from you. Fair enough. <laughs> well, another, I, I, another one, I, Andrew, I take, I... Well, I somewhat take take it, take what I said back, Charlotte. I I do agree with you with the Shostakovich <laughs> quintet. Um, absolutely, it is a very dem democratic piece. I just I don't think I've ever quite got over my disappointment um, when I was much younger of of knowing the second piano trio and knowing some Shostakovich, and then discovering that he'd also written this piano quintet. And imagining what that has sounded like. Wow, can you imagine what it's going to sound like? That excitement of not knowing it yet. And then when I did get to know it, I was I was a bit disappointed by it. Because uh, I was imagining a sort of the Tenth Symphony or the <laughs> First Violin Concerto or something really bombastic and sort of, yeah, the, the, the sort of stuff I really liked when I was a teenager. I mean, I still like it. Yeah. But, uh, you know. um, <laughs> and then this rather sort of quizzical... Um, and yes, the, we always used to call it the Hamlet movement, the fourth movement, and the, the last movement. What is the last movement about? I know what it's about when I'm performing yeah. it, um, but it, it, very often the audience doesn't. And if they, you know, if they start fidgeting because they're just a bit uncomfortable by the whole thing, uh, it may, you know, made to feel uncomfortable, um, then the a performance of that can really fall flat because it's a very tricky end to pull off. And it disappears into just this cute G major, and and they quite like the scherzo. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm with you on that one too. Anyway, um, <laughs> so it's a tricky piece from a performance point of view, but a, but a great one. Um, now, so let me let me ask you next piece. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me let, let's let's go into it by asking another question, sort of on the side of mm. what you were talking about with the inclusion of a piano, which you find difficult or or unsatisfactory. Yes. How easy, when you're a quartet, and we all know about quartets being a proper unit, and you play together for a long, long time, and you were as one, if you like, in your sound. What about when an interloper appears on the cello or on the violin, or viola or whatever it is for your, for your string quintet? How easy is that to actually deal with as a, as a well-established little group? Um. Oh well, I suppose you eventually you find your favourites to collaborate with, and and that yeah. you know you, you you build up that rapport. Um, um, but there is a, uh, I have no proof, but I, I believe there's a some sort of chamber music gene, you know, that you have or you don't have, um, in all <laughs> aspects of life, um, <laughs> and it's that the collaborative, just the ability to listen and to understand what somebody else is doing telepathically without having to talk and to you know and the more you have to talk about things the, the more it points towards that perhaps you're not on the same page um unless of course the conversation is really fascinating you know in which case that's great too but uh, um uh yes i mean pianists are the are the ones that um were, were problematic you know there are very few um that that really just have the, the the right touch the right you know we we recorded 
when I was in the in the Brodsky, we recorded the Shostakovich with Christian Blackshaw, who is one of the most subtle of you know uh, pianists. He, he would he would be incredibly concerned that his his pianos were too loud, let alone the fortissimos. I mean, you know, he was, um, uh, and that's that's a rare thing to find. And he was a, a joy, you know. Um, but on the other hand, when you have one of those big stereotypical Russian, not necessarily actually Russian, but give, giving it the the big you know. Um, virtuosic performance that's a thrill too and it's it, there's something to be said for that but uh if no one can actually hear you either i don't know it's yeah okay well you, but you um, okay you've exorc you've you've through this program you've exorcised yes. pianos so what what are you left with in your choice pianos and pianos as i said I, I i was i'm really thinking in categories and i may i know i shouldn't but i'm so i'm moving on to the to the woodwind now i think it's the brahms clarinet quintet i, I mean i think it has to be um mm -hmm. not the mozart but the Brahms, uh, with with a with a close second from the Coleridge Taylor clarinet quintet, just just because I like mm -hmm. I know you like uh, some some more obscure repertoire, um, which I would highly recommend. Uh, uh, it's it's a, a good piece, um, and very attractive, and and I, I got to play it for uh, some dignitaries from Sierra Leone when I was back at music college, but uh, uh, it's been a long time. But anyway, the Brahms quintet, for me, uh, really. Um, you know, has a special place. The music from I, I'm not a huge fan of Brahms. Um, I find him problematic. I I look. I love Brahms. I love performing Brahms. I know you know. Uh, but there is a part of me that agrees with Benjamin Britten that he knew how to write music that sounds great. You know, which is a very cutting thing to to say. Yes. Uh, but some there are some pieces of music that I think well, if you just take away the two against three, what are you left with? You know, and if you take away all the rules that are in the performer's heads about how it has to sound, what are you left with? You know, um, and is the material as good as something that Schumann would have written, or is that material better but just not sort of dressed up as much as Brahms knew how to do it? And I, some, I just, I'm just suspicious sometimes. But then, of course, you know, actually, it's, it makes a really good noise. Uh, so you have to forgive him, you know. Um, but those are the <laughs> thoughts going, you know, uh, that I have with Brahms. And I don't have those thoughts when I play the clarinet quintet. Um, I find everything in it genuine. I find the emotions in it genuine. Um, most, yes, I think, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm on board with him. I'm not following a set of rules. I'm not sort of... Uh, aggrandizing any of the notes uh, beyond what I think they're worth I th everything everything feels right when you play it as long as you've got the right clarinetist to play it with um, uh, and you know I've had some extraordinary uh, you know very pleasurable times uh, performing performing that piece and you know it, uh, it will always yeah it's, it's it speaks to me and it speaks to the audience too um, I've got a I've got another quote about Brahms by Benjamin Britten, if you want it. He said mm -hmm. he, he claimed that he plays through the whole of Brahms at intervals to see whether Brahms is really as bad as he thought and ends up by discovering <laughs> he's actually much worse. There you are. Um, and was very upset that he was going to be next to him on the shelf. <laughs> well, any 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 mm -hmm. any other Brahms um, chosen by the others? Charlotte, yeah, Richard, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, actually, the clarinet quintet was almost on my five, just because I mean, it's such a surprising piece. I mean, that wonderful that just in terms of openings of a quintet to have those, you know, the two violins opening alone, circling, and then this rising quintet. I mean, I just imagine being in the audience for the first time at the premiere for that. And Brahms described um, Richard. It was written for Richard Mulfelt, and he was. He came. He inspired Brahms to come out of retirement for this piece. Brahms hearing this clarinetist play, and Brahms described him as the nightingale of the orchestra. And gosh, you hear that. Um, just the the sheer love of Mulfeld's sound. You hear that in that first opening phrase. But it was actually going back to the idea of you know what is a quintet and is a piano quintet uh, piano versus um, a quartet. Um, the F minor piano quintet uh, is, is, I think, a really interesting, the backstory is a fascinating one in terms of piano versus strings, isn't it? Uh, one of the many instances of Brahms the Perfectionist, it began life in 1862 as a string quintet with two cellos, 
um, very much looking after the, um, the Schubert C major, which no doubt we'll talk about a bit later. And he premiered in that form, but um, Joseph Joachim was, at the con um, was the first violinist and he thought it didn't work. And poor old Brahms, who was about 29 at the time, and he always had a bit of an inferiority complex. He, he just put it in a drawer and thought, well, it must be right, it must be awful. And then a couple of years later, he got it back out again and thought, right, I'll turn it into the sonata for two pianos. And at which point Clara Schumann heard it and said, what do you do that for? It's a strings piece. There are only a few bits that didn't work. And what, what on earth happened? Couldn't you have just changed it slightly? So poor Brahms went back to the drawing board and came up with the result of this um, F minor piano quintet. I just think it's fabulous. You've got this orchestral grandeur at the beginning. Um, the, the second subject of the first movement, that smooth romantic, um, it just tugs at the heartstrings. I love it. And then the scherzo, I think this is a really great scherzo, this tense, rhythmically pulsing entrance. And then a C major folky explosion with offbeat rhythms, but, but it's also so grand and noble. It's so Brahms. But the thing I most like about this quintet is the final, simply because it's so surprising. I mean, it's the F minor is a dark key anyway, and this is the bleakest moment of the whole piece, the, the opening of the final. Um, in terms of meter, you're all at C. Um, but it's the harmonic, the, the harmonic language, the chromatic language. I mean, we there's a lot being said and written about links between Brahms and Schoenberg. And here it is in 1862, um, this incredible chromatic writing. You literally do not know where you are. And I think if you were just to hear those few bars by themselves, not knowing who had composed them with no context, I think you would struggle to put, say, Brahms. I think you would struggle to say 1860s. Um, really revolutionary writing. Well, Bra Brahms uh, was mentioned quite a lot on Facebook when I put this question to everybody, as I normally do each week. Uh, lots of, uh, not just the clarinet quintet but others as well um, and um, now I'm just going to mention a few of them here because actually we've got some some really interesting choices here you can tell me whether any of these chime with you Richard um, we've got uh, the foray piano quintet see you Ina um, we've got Mozart quintet piano and wind Samuel Barber summer music um, and Malcolm Arnold Brass Quintet, which I'm going to talk about. We've got Corn Gold's Piano Quintet in here. A vote for that from Rosalind Porter. I mean, there's lots. I'll go through them actually a little bit more in the end, and we'll have a little vote on on those. But any of those ring true for you, Richard? Well, I'm, I'm glad someone mentioned the Mozart Piano and Wind Quintet. So I'll come back mm. to that. Anyways, I just wanted to get in my piece about Brahms while I was still on, on the subject. I, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to anyway validate. You know, Benjamin Britten's sort of trite, smart arsy 1920s <laughs> sort of middle middle class modernist sort of um, prejudices there. Um, but there there is something. Um, I, Brahms, when he's good, when he hits a spot, is glorious, so glorious. Um, and I can think, certainly his G major string quintet. I mean, that's one of the great moments for a cellist when you about openings, sort of striding through this. Sort of texture, a sort of great striding melody that the cello opens. And, that, and that's a, I think that's a really accomplished and enjoyable work. On the other hand, there are these moments of Brahms. I mean, Charlotte was just talking about this. She got, got I think, to the to the heart of the issue with the F minor piano quintet. Is that, you know, he went through about three or four different iterations of, of what this should be played by before settling on the piano strings combination. He's not, you know, I, what was, it was often that feeling was for him, he's, he, he's got a sort of there's an abstract argument that needs to be put across, and the, and, and, and the the means is almost secondary to that. Um, and I think the worst possible example of this in the whole of his music. I mean, it's a shame his his first string quintet with viola um, in F major. I think it begins with two of the finest chain music moments he ever movements he ever wrote. Two glorious, expansive, lyrical, beautifully written movements, and then this absolute god awful finale this terribly trite <laughs> um appallingly artificial movement um which um it's you know it's well constructed that's the point the thing works it builds momentum it builds a pace the me melodic material it's almost like you know this is the first this is if he sort of jotted down the first thing that came to his head and thought i think of a proper melody later and stick that in and never really bothered you know it's that sensation you sometimes get with schubert's great c major symphony um <laughs> you know and, he, and it, it, it's a horrible horrible movement um these most trite, cliche little, uh, feeble little themes um, built into this great structure that works really well, but the, the quality of the inspiration is so low, you feel that that would it didn't even really matter to him. And it's when you set that against something as, as sublime as a clarinet quintet, as transcendent 
as, as absolutely accomplished on every level was, was profoundly moving. Um, it's okay, let's, yeah. let's move on. I mean, Mozart piano and wind. Yeah, well, this, this is it. I mean, of all the Mozart quintets, I mean, God, I mean, he wrote the best string quintets. Um, he wrote the best clarinet quintet of all time. Um, he wrote certainly the best piece that's ever been written for horn and strings. <laughs> um, um, in, in, you know, the, the horn quintet, though, it's, 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 you know, it's not a complex work. The piano, the piano and wind quintet is one, of course, as a string player I'm barred from playing. Um, but what an extraordinary piece! What a glorious piece! And it's it's um, the the way he mixes the colours, a sort of kaleidoscopic way, his absolute sense of each of the instruments' characters, all the playfulness, all the conversation, the sense of. I mean, this is early in the history of the piano. He's writing for a fairly lightweight instrument that really is an equal amongst the four winds. Um, we all know how well Mozart understood and loved wind play, uh, wind instruments. You know, they, he didn't play them himself, but he his really hung around with a lot of wind players they were great great friends always interested by what they could do and he really writes to them as if he understands them he sort of each of the melodies is sculpted into these two these short these short melodic phrases these short motifs um because he, he knows they need to breathe he knows they need space to do that it's not exhausting um and then he just the way he blends and mixes oboe and clarinet you know bassoon bubbling away underneath piano um glorious and horn melodies um and it's all done with that charm, that wit, that comic opera sensibility, um, and that warmth, which comes to the fact that you know he's writing for friends and trying to do something really special. He's doing something he's absolutely delighting in his own skill, his own ability, and it comes through in every bar of this absolutely gorgeous piece. And the fascinating thing is, I mean, um, his string quintets kind of set up a precedent that virtually every 19th century German romantic composer felt they had to follow. They all had a go. Um, Brahms, as I said, not always totally feeling it, I suspect. Um other composers doing it with varying degrees of success, but the no, no one ever really successfully imitated the piano and wind quintet. It's an achievement that Mozart pulled, you know, only Mozart can pull off, and only Mozart did pull off. Beethoven had a go with his Opus 16 a few years, only about five or six years later, and it kind of doesn't quite work, you know, it kind of devolves into a piano concert. So, wind players tell me it's absolutely exhausting to play because he's kind of forgotten them, not really noticed to begin with those kind of the elements of Mozart's craftsmanship. That make it work, um, and the Mozart piece is just it's just an endless delight. So, I mean, he wrote to his dad Le- Leopold that he thinks it's the best piece he's ever written, um, and you know Mozart didn't talk about his music much. When he says something like that, I think it's something you have to you know he, he means it, um, and he's got a point in this case. I think he you know he's really proud. He wanted Leopold to know about it. His dad was a fellow composer. He knew he'd achieve something very very special, and it's just the piece is just every time I hear it, it's just. It's just pleasure. It's just lovely. It's lucid. It's clear. It's playful. It's witty. It's charming. It's colourful. All these things. Okay, we we move on. I want to champion, as I always do, Malcolm Arnold. Uh, I mentioned it before. Um, his brass quintet doesn't really need championing, really, because it's actually one of his most performed pieces. But I think it's one of those pieces for brass that, oh I mean, yeah, the string quartet is always going to get the plaudits and and and, and everything for for being one of the one of the great and most important ensembles. But I think Arnold helped elevate the brass quintet as an ensemble, um, and as as a serious uh, ensemble to write for. He wrote it in the very early sixties for the New York Brass Quintet, who were really like the gold standard when it came to uh, brass playing at that time. Um, and uh, I think it's just one of his classic little constructions. It's a very compact piece, it's only about 15 minutes or so. It doesn't outstay its welcome like so many quintets do. Um, and uh, the uh, <laughs> the first moment is sort of these big broad lines so sort of establishing the, the, the style and the feel of it. One of those great second movements that Arnold is so brilliant at where it's a chicane. It just sort of teeters on the edge of, of something darker. You're never quite sure where it's going to go. Quite moving, um, and of course that that was exactly what Malcolm was like. You never quite knew what what was going to happen next with him, and uh, he was so um, naturally uh, um, edging towards darkness so much in in his life. And then the last movement is all sunshine. So you get all those nice mixes of styles. But it's such so brilliantly written. He was a trumpeter, of course, so he really knows his way in and out of all of those instruments and exactly what to do and how to push them uh, technically. And in fact, at that point, it really did push a lot of technique. Um, now, I, it's really one of those pieces I think most people could just play. Because so often is the case, you know, even in that short amount of time, 60 years, the, the, um, the, the general standard of playing has come on so far. And it's pieces like this that have helped that, I think, that have helped push that through. There are actually a lot of really good brass quintet 
works now a lot of a lot of really interesting ones um, and a lot of them are played because of course there are a lot of quintets out there and they want music they want new music to play so it gets played a lot because there's only and and i guess this is a another thing about um about the whole uh, genre of quintets is that uh, you know it's not as difficult to get four other people together as it is a whole orchestra together to play your music so of course these I and mean, a lot of these pieces will exist very successfully in the amateur area as well of course because people just want to sit around at least did until the pandemic they just want to sit around and play music together and that's something that all of the music i think we're or at least most of the music we're talking about today uh, allows us uh, to do rather uh, with great pleasure doesn't it so the the brass quintet i think uh, arnold i mean there's a reason why it's play, played a lot i think it'd be, it's because it's compact it really does have that great mix of playfulness and darkness that arnold is so well known for and so brilliant at, and it's so well written for the instruments so i know andrew you you weren't going to um pick a brass quintet so i've done it for you uh let's move on let's have another let's have another choice from from you andrew well okay um carrying on the same kind of theme uh obviously the one of the things that the brodsky quartet was famous for and still is famous for is their work with uh voice quartet and and, yeah. and singers um of all sorts of you know different genres um so to cut a long story short, I mean, you know, my uh, there's there's still there are only a couple of recordings from th those days that I can still listen to of myself. No one ever likes listening to themselves, you know. Uh, they're all recordings, but there is one disc that I I, I listen to because uh, I was very lucky to be kind of part of it, and um, and it's a disc of Respighi chamber music that we made. Uh, two of the string mm. quartets. So he wrote three, believe it or not. I think I gave you one of them as my one of my favorite quartets when you when you talked about string quartets on, on Facebook, but um, no one mentioned yeah. it funnily enough. Um, but also, <laughs> also on that disc is a, a piece I, I absolutely love and uh, and had the, the pleasure of recording with Anne Sophie von Otto. It's uh, Il Tramonto by Respighi. Now, I hope that counts as a quintet. There are five people. I know there's another version for string yeah. orchestra, but the, the one for five people is, you know, it's it's everything you've ever wanted from, uh, you know, a bit of Puccini if you're a string chamber music player. You know, <laughs> it's 20, 20 minutes long. It's got the full, you know, operatic sort of highs and, and uh, but that intimacy, the sort of throbbing Italianate music that you don't really get to play as a string quartet, you know, that the really lyrical sort of uh, playing. Um, and I think it's, you know, the, the, the setting of the, the poem is absolutely stunning. Uh, it's uh, really memorable melodies and textures. Everybody gets a go at playing something meaningful whilst you're playing it. Um, but also not played very often. I want to champion it. I want to, uh, I'm hoping to program it here in Sydney at some point. I get to direct a few concerts. Obviously, there's a chamber or orchestra version of it. Um, and, you know, because people are keen to hear what I'm enthusiastic about. So I, um, if you don't know it, go and, go and hear it. It's a fabulous piece. Yeah, fascinating. I wonder whether one extra instrument is something that can attract composers who wouldn't normally write quartets perhaps so it's a, a, a quartet is a quite an intimidating ensemble to write for because of the sheer history rich history <laughs> involved in writing for that ensemble and actually one extra instrument adds so much more when it comes to color and texture absolutely um and that's definitely something i i you know i want to talk about when when i you know come to uh, my other choices about the, the, what right. happens to uh, to 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 the composers with that extra voice, you know, because the quartet, in all sorts of ways, the quartet is quite an intimidating thing for not just for the composers, but also when, if you're playing in one, you know, it's, it can be two against two, it can be one against three, it can be four individuals against each other or or with each other, you know, I, um, that doesn't that those dynamics don't exist in trios or quintets, you know, those the, the odd numbers somehow. Get rid of uh, those those tensions, uh, the, the the problematic relationships, and I'm I'm I am talking about human beings as well as composers writing for those four uh, voices. You know, um, even just the practicalities of writing four lines of music. If you have a, you know a, a very simple terms, you know, a bass line, some harmony, and a melody. Well, that's fine. You know, so you've got that. If you only want to add a counter melody, you've got to sacrifice something. You know, in the texture, you've got to keep things going. Uh, that's obviously a very simplistic 
analysis, you know, but but of course people have come up with incredible ways of, of uh, you know, getting around that. And you look at all the, the late Beethoven quartets and the way that, you know, the, the little bits of a complement uh, appear in each line um, and as if as if there's that fifth player, you know, who just has the accompaniment going, but somehow he manages to keep it, keep the, the texture alive in your imagination. But when you add that fifth player, um, then, uh, you know, it, things are easier. Things are, are um, uh, d d different sets of Im imaginations are, are, are let loose. Maybe this is the moment then to talk about the Schubert Quintet in C, is it? In terms of what you do, what Absolutely. happens when that extra <laughs> instrumentalist comes in. This is the one, isn't it? Yes. Um, when he added a second cello and oh just what that does I mean that engine that bass engine room this warm rich sound Richard and I did uh, classics reconsidered for gramophone on this and um, this chair and for me there are two schools of thought aren't there there's the whole idea of this second cello becoming just another part of the texture and there's another idea where the second cello becomes something far bigger and richer and warmer and you do have, kind of have this heavier engine room if you like i'm actually in the second camp i like to have some serious bass down there some serious warmth mm. um, but the way he yeah, uses this cello is just wonderful i always think of the um the first movement when you've got these two cellos playing in thirds and sixths together and it is absolutely magical and then of course you've got this um my favorite movement i think would be the adagio um this slow constantly unfurling melody um, from the violins pizzicato cello and when it's played well that movement time just stands still and um, I've mentioned before that the last real serious wonderful live concert that I was at was in September in Bremen with Quattro Modigliani and they're just about to go into a Schubert focus year um, preparing for the anniversary and they, this was the main piece on the program and just 200 of us sitting in Die Glocke's 1200 seater hall listening to this extraordinary slow movement reverberating around this almost empty space it was one of the most profound and moving concert experiences I've had in years and yeah it's it's a quintet where he he gives you the full gamut doesn't he I mean the first movement it's full of unexpected twists and turns we get everything from funeral march to barnyard stomp throughout the course of the piece I I think the whole thing is just genius and it's extraordinary to think that he wrote it only two months before his death and he was still only 31 just everything about it is just perfectly crafted and although you have death and you have the smiling through tears there's also it's a piece that just has so much life in it. The um, I, I, it's absolutely on my top five list, and I I would assume that we we all think it's probably a a Bible and Shakespeare piece in in this context. Um, I agree with you, Charlotte. The, it's the richness of that bottom end that is so wonderful, uh, and it's such a brilliant um, thing to do to add all of that sound in with that one instrument. Um, actually, I mean, you saying about how it, it, it for that. For that uh, for the slow movement i find it very difficult to listen to that movement for a number of, sort of personal reasons but actually the bit that really makes the hair stand on the back of my neck and really does stop i mean it, sometimes in performances it's like you, you just can't breathe through it it's that extraordinary trio section in the third movement mm. when you've had all this bravado and, and and jolliness and playfulness in the scherzo and then all of a sudden seemingly out of nowhere this astonishing personal very intimate little section and i have to say another recording that i think is unsurpassed which is the amadeus quartet with william pleaf the way they move together in that section is just jaw-dropping i think it's a stunning recording uh, all round but but i wanted to ask andrew about that section what on earth mm. is he doing in that in that section because like, it does feel like almost like suddenly another piece in the middle of that middle of that movement and it feels so moving. It's I find it unbearably moving. Absolutely, uh, but Schubert always does that in his trios. His, he saves something special for the trio of the of the third movement, whatever you know, the, the, the scherzo movement. And I've um, it's even, it's my favorite bit of Death and the Maiden as well, and also the the G major quartet. Mm. You know, the the, the um, he's, there's something awfully profound and and moving in the place you least expect it. Um, I, I I'm trying to recall. Haydn trios in minuets. I'm, I I might think of one or two, maybe if I was you know. But 
or even Mozart. What I mean, the, oh no, I can think of one. Um, but, <laughs> but Schubert has it's, it's his favorite place to go. He like, he does something special in his trios, and that particular one, um, yeah, you can you can sense if your hearts are beating at the same speed, just as in the silences, as the fi five of you are looking. How are we going to play that next upbeat? Ta -da. Yeah. Ta -da. And you can't yeah. count really the rests in between. It's it's all about if the audience is fidgeting or coughing, and of course most of the time they're not. Like if if you if you you know if you're lucky or you know, <laughs> if you're doing a good job. Um, yeah. And yes, so time does stand still, literally stand still. Even the the pulse stands still, and there's just something you just you know you notice how the the right hands of your four other colleagues are going, and when that next chord is coming in. Um, and yes, each harmony suggests a different mood and a different, you know, there's a glimmer of hope and then actually that's gone immediately. And then there's, you know, you're, you're shifting from, you really have no idea what, how you're going to feel from one, one bar to the next. And that's I think it's my, pretty difficult it's going back to the scherzo, you know, yeah. after all of that, it's, you, you, yes. it feels right, right, quite trite, you know, and then you know, the, the piece is kind of finished. You've got to finish the scherzo and then get to the last one, which is fabulous and it's a great, but it's not in the same league yeah. as the first two movements and that bit, that, that, that scherzo. So uh, that's uh, the, the trio, yeah. I think that trio is my favorite bit of Schubert all, uh, uh, in his entire repertoire. So Andrew puts it so, so beautifully, I hardly want to interrupt. I'm just interested about, again, I, was, I just want to take issue slightly with something you said about, about the texture of the thing, Tommy. I mean, the, 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 the sort of added reinforced bottom end of the group. I mean, for me, I, I've played both the cello parts at one time or another in the quintet. And it's uh, essentially, it's, I mean, with, generally with quintets, certainly string quintets, for me, it's more about enriching the middle. It's about um, putting a central voice in a stronger and, and, and richer middle voice in the ensemble. And that's really what you have in that Schubert quintet. I mean, what Andrew was saying earlier about how in the string repertoire, you don't get much chance to really sing in an Italian fashion. Well, for me, the string quintet is just this epitome of the Italianate element of of Vini style, um, the, the, when the cello and the viola are singing together, or the two cellos are singing together in the first movement, there's that sort of sensuous thirds and sixths Italian and lyrical sweetness. Um, it really is, it, and it's you know, it's that incredible sweetness and sensuality, and you get it at the end. Well, in the middle of, of the finale as well, when everyone's just going, yeah, da, 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 da. just sort of these long, melting, sort of shifting phrases with these sensuous thirds and sixth lyrical harmonies. And, and it's interesting, I, 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 it's, it's always this question of texture, because um, the other great Schubert quintet that we haven't mentioned at all, the Trout, um, mm. it sets a piano, um, not against a string quartet, but a string trio plus double bass. Now, once you have a double bass in the mix, suddenly it seems to me you've got a much more equal proposition than a standard piano quintet. The bass gives you the welly, the wallop, that sort of bounce to the group, that 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 um, oomph to the group, that lift. But it, it does allow a, a lightness and airiness and a sort of sense of equality between the players that you don't perhaps get in other piano quintets. And it's again, it's about weight at the bottom. Whereas I think with the C, the C major quintet, it's it's the middle that's intensifying. It's the heart of the piece. It's a, the inner warmth. Um, and again, you get that with the older quintet. So it's a different colour. Different... I didn't really mean the bass exactly. I, I meant warmth mm. really more than anything, because I think just adding another cello does do that. I mean, that's clearly why he did it. Mm. I mean, yes, but, but also it has that range that the viola perhaps doesn't have. It can go down further down, but it does have that middle, beautiful middle warmth range. We need to move on. Richard, you need to come up with a, with another one, please. Well, um, we talked about that there aren't many piano and wind quintets to Mozart that really made it. There aren't really that many two cello quintets after Schubert. I mean, follow that. Um, there is one that I love from that we, we used to play on the days when we played with Schubert C major, and which I don't think anyone remotely claims in the same league, but I think it's still a very beautiful lovable and underrated work. Um, it's Glazunov's string quintet for two cellos, opus 39 in A major. And um, Glazunov wrote a lot of string chain music. I think he wrote, I think, seven string quartets in total. Very, very polished. If you haven't heard those, you'll never really fully get where Shostakovich is coming from. It's something I've always maintained. But so much of Shostakovich's style is based in Glazunov's um, string writing. Um, but if you want to actually listen to it purely for pleasure, um, just as you know, a thoroughly enjoyable play. The C major, the the C, the A major quintet for two cellos, 
um, string, you know, string quartet with two cellos by Glazunov. Um, it, it has it all. Um, he's at, he's one of these composers who's at his best in sunny lyrical music, and this is really sunny, really lyrical. It begins this broad, uncoiling, expansive viola melody, which just opens out into these rich sunlit textures. All the things we were just talking about with the two cellos, he really makes the most of that sensuality and warmth in a very Russian way. Um, I mean, I, 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 I always think if, if Glazunov is, if, if, if Rachmaninoff is a sort of wintry Russian landscape, Glazunov is a summer equivalent. You're talking of huge sunlit steps, you know, birch forests rustling in the afternoon, sort of peasants reclining by lazily winding rivers in grassy meadows, and all, all those cliches. These wonderful Russian folk dance for finale with tunes which I think are as good as anything in Tchaikovsky's trade music. And certainly, I think this is this one piece, I think that extra amount of richness, it kind of gets him somewhere that his string quartets don't quite get, much as I'm, I'm fond of them and love them. Um, but this string quintet, it's just, it's, it's radiant, it's sunny, it's beautiful, it's lyrical. It's a good way to decompress after the Schubert. Playing the Schubert is usually such an intense emotional high. Um, the Glasnov quintet, I think, really, really understands and uses the texture with immense skill and immense craftsmanship. Um, and it also plays to his natural strength, this lyricism, this sunny character, this warmth, uh, this sense of colour. I mean, he's a cellist. Um, himself, and I think you could really tell in this piece. It's a real cellist piece, even though it begins with a viola solo. Um, and yeah, I, I just thought I'd put it out there because it's it's not a well known piece at all. I think if you only listen, I, I, I say if you only want to listen to one piece of string chain music by Glazunov, um, I, I would recommend that was his string quintet for two cellos, A major, opus thirty nine. So- so you're so lucky, Richard, being, being a cellist, that you, you're able to play so much of this repertoire. I, I've said it before, I think, on the podcast, but I love being a percussionist, but so much of the <laughs> repertoire uh, is is beyond you because, you know, you, you know there, there is so much, pain. so much of this wonderful repertoire that if you're a string player, whatever instrument you play, you can sit down and play so much of this great repertoire with your friends in your living room or whatever it is you want to do. But as a percussionist, you just don't get that opportunity with these great swathes of this wonderful repertoire, all of which we're talking about today. But there are some. So I did want to throw in um, Steve Reich's Music for Pieces of Wood, <laughs> which is for five uh, claves, different pitched claves. I've played this piece so many times. It is a absolute classic of Steve Reich's music, of course, uh, pure minimalism uh, with with one particular uh, one pulse with one person plays the highest clave all the way through as a pulse and everybody else plays very recognizable um steve reich rhythms that that slowly shift through patterns and um it's a wonderful piece piece to play it's one of those pieces i think for audience that you just sort of let wet go over you and you can hear all the different textures as you go through you can pick out every time you hear it you hear something maybe different you hear different shifts in the in the rhythms and all the rest of it i think it's actually a very satisfying piece to to listen to as well as to play Um, i once played it in canterbury cathedral which i think acoustic wise is just about the worst place you could play a piece for six claves ever because instead of it sounding like it just sounded like for about 10 minutes um it was a very strange place to do it absolutely no clarity whatsoever but it's one of those great pieces so it, it is a night there are a, a number of percussion pieces pieces for, for, for five players but i think that this is a this is a classic one and of course it's one if you happen to have claves around you can just sort of sit up sit and just do like you can if you are uh, a bunch of string players and you can just get the music out off the shelf and, and play as well it's one of those pieces that can uh, can really satisfy on on that level uh, such a great piece and i'd forgotten really almost until about 10 minutes before we started recording that it was in fact a quintet of percussionists and i was very pleased to suddenly remember it and so i could uh, so i could throw throw it in andrew another one from you it's time for my contentious answer um i hope Excellent. i don't know if i'm going to be disqualified for this one um I would like to nominate, for lots of reasons, any quintet that won the Cobbett Prize, because I'm rather fond of all of the ones that I've played. <laughs> and this this prize that was set up by a, a, a wealthy businessman who wanted to uh, expand the repertoire of fantasies in classical music and uh, for, for chamber music, and um, a twelve-minute free-form piece. Uh, and every year there was a you know he he put the prize money up for the for a, a competition, and it produced lots of very attractive, really interesting pieces. Not all of them are quintets, but um, 
since I've, believe it or not, since even since I've been in Australia, which is, is you know, okay, I've been here eight years now, I've been invited to lots of fabulous, you know, uh, chamber music festivals that they have, usually in nice wineries and, you know, out of the way, and there's lots of eating and drinking. Um, and there are guest artists that fly in, and it's amazing the number of, of these quintets that I've played or have just come in really useful because mm. there isn't another piece for bass clarinet and string quartet or um actually if you've got a horn player a stellar horn player to coming in that's it's another great piece to add to the concert um you know so yes the stanford rhapsody horn quintet the york bowen uh, quintet for for bass clarinet um and and, and quartet is a, it's a great piece uh and I had the pleasure of playing that with Paul Dean in Brisbane uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you're probably, you know, are familiar with his brother Brett, but Paul is a, you know, is a, is a great, a great figure here uh, in Australia. Fabulous clarinetist, a fabulous composer, and, uh, and just, you know, he's a, a lovely man too. And uh, yeah, it's, so he he runs a, a chamber, you know, that's a bit like the National Ensemble over in Brisbane, and I invited. If you, me and a couple of my, my colleagues over and you know we put, put puts together these these interesting programs so that happened i i played the the stamford with steve sterling in in a winery just north of melbourne and it, it's they they kind of these pieces exist uh and have created income for musicians and pleasure and you know employment and listening to the pleasure for the audience benjamin britain's two viola quintet is in this category as well which is rather a nice piece and i dare say you i don't know it's it's not it's not often played just a short little sort of waltz but i rather love it um so can i have hmm. that as a as a as a quintet or am i disqualified so if you if you're gonna if you're gonna pick one <laughs> out of that <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't pick any of them if it was just the one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, fair I enough. was hoping to go as a for the for the whole <laughs> lot, just for the sort of you know novelty value. Yes, fair of it. But but I do love them, Richard. Uh, I did toy with the Vaughan Williams fantasy quintet, which is one of that series. Yeah, um, it, it didn't yes. make it to my final cut in the end. Though. This is a fascinating piece. Um, it, yeah, it's an amazing That's collection of pieces, isn't it? Harp it really quintet. Is. Yeah. So many of them. Wow. So many of them. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. uh, Charlotte. Let's uh, start sort of summarising a little bit more of our, our, our final choices. <laughs> what, what what ones have we missed out from you? Okay, I'll give you my two final ones. Um, neither neither of them terribly original, but Vorjak Quintet Number Two in A Major. I mean, this is Vorjak the Czech folk esque tune smith, tune smith in full swing here. I mean, the first movement full of surprises, fabulous gear shifts, switches, and texture meter that you just wouldn't anticipate um there's a gorgeous cello solo at one point over rocking chords um and then for me the dumka um my gosh when i first heard this piece i just kept on rewinding back to the beginning of this one um that delicate sweetly melancholic piano figure and then a funeral march and with this one it makes me think now knowing more about Vorjak, about remember in earworms week i mentioned his f minor um romance that i just cannot get out of my head um but <laughs> it's well, it's your fault. I talked about it's how, fault, yeah, it's my fault. Um, but he talked <laughs> about, um, I, I talked about the fact that it was written in this absolutely appalling year where he lost three of his children. And, you know, this is now eight years later when he wrote this quintet. Um, but you don't get over that kind of thing. It always stays with you. And, and now when I hear this movement, there is something just so exquisitely sad and fragile um it, it makes me think of that time of his life and perhaps he was thinking of that too and then this whirling twinkle toed skirt so um blend of a waltz and a fury I mean, it's fabulous stuff and then schumann piano quintet in e flat major and mm. tell me what it is about this one um the, the sheer disconnect that this is such a likable piece when schumann was being such a total sod as he wrote it and I just find it's absolutely fascinating. He wrote it in 1842. He was married to, for the past two years to Clara Vieck. And for the first time, they, I don't think they had any children yet, or so they were only very tiny. And the two of them had gone touring together. Um, I think it was the only time that they did this. And um, Clara, she was still in her early 20s. Schumann was, I think, 32. And she was at the height of her fame. Um, she was a massive virtuoso performer. And basically, Schumann appears to have gone on this tour, and after three weeks, 
um, he wasn't getting as many concerts. She wasn't playing his music. He was having a few alcoholic bouts. He was depressed. He complained of being ill. And he effectively said after three weeks, right, I'm, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going back to Leipzig to eat worms. And so off he goes. And then this quartet, this quintet comes. And, and then, I mean, poor old Clara, she tried her best. She tried over and over again to perform it. And again, he was a total swine with her. There's this one famous anecdote where the poor woman was playing it and she, he actually beat, beat out the rhythm of the first movement on her shoulder as she played it so that she wouldn't rush it. I mean, but it's absolutely wonderful stuff. I mean, this first movement sort of leaps and bounces. <laughs> Yeah, and it reminds me of a little bit of his um, folk songs for cello and piano. You, you have all of that. And then this almost funeral march, second movement, fabulous skirt, so which is almost Mendelssohn-like in its delicacy. And then this masterstroke final where you've got this double fugue based on the main themes of the first and the final movements. Uh, so it's brilliantly written and it's one of these pieces you have to forget about the man when you're listening to it. It's funny, recording this po podcast on the week of International mm -hmm. Women's Day, Clara Wieck needed International Women's Day like no other woman in classical music, I think. Maybe we should uh, do a top five pieces written by terrible people. We'll have a think about that. Uh, Richard, yeah. Richard, come on. Uh, you're, you're another couple from you uh, to, to summarise as we close. Uh, quickly, the, the, the Vorjak E flat major string quintet, which is a, as he wrote in America at the same time as his American quartet, I think is even more gloriously tuneful, even more melodious, even more inspired. Um, the, We've barely touched on Mozart or Mendelssohn. Mozart, the greatest strict writer of quartets, quintets for two violas ever, bar none. Uh, his C major quintet, I think, is his single largest and most ambitious chamber work. The, the two works I, I really want to sort of spend time over, um, I, I could not forgive myself if I did not mention. Um, I absolutely have to talk about the Bruckner string quintet, without question, the greatest string quintet for two violas since, since Mozart. Um, surpasses surpasses Brahms, surpasses um, Mendelssohn's efforts in that vein, certainly surpasses Beethoven's solitary thing. Um, it's a, a work of incredible transcendent beauty and intimacy, modelled, I think, on, on, the Schu on the Schubert C major quintet um, for two cellos, but I sang of two violas here. Um, and it's, um, you know, it kind of really does sort of put puts a flight all those kind of lazy stupid arrogant things people say about brook and people who haven't really listened and are, you know um <laughs> comparing it to marla really <laughs> i mean this is this is music completely um itself completely its own personality and also completely appropriate to to the form um i mean all the spaciousness all the inwardness all that kind of harmonic complexity and at the same time great simplicity that one finds in brookner is all there in this music all perfectly proportioned down to string to, to, to a size of a string quintet. Um, the, the opening phrases are just absolutely, I don't know, pure poetry for me, deeply, deeply touching. And then this adagio, um, the third movement, it's in, in D flat major, I seem to recall. And I mean, I, I, I remember the first time I ever played it. Um, it's one of those occasions I, I just found myself started trembling while I was actually trying to play the music for the first time because I was so moved by what I was hearing. So profoundly beautiful. It's one that it's sort of in the Beethoven class as a slow movement, I would say, easily. Uh, the finale doesn't work particularly well. Um, that gets plenty of composers. I think Brahms, as we said, is guilty of far worse. Um, but uh, taken as a whole, the piece is a piece of such character, such beauty, such conviction, um, such intimacy, um, such poetry, and such warmth. I think I think we really have to, and it has to be in any list of great string quintets. Uh, the other one I would not put in the list of all-time great string quintets. It's a personal personal favourite. We we used to the string quintet I used to play in regularly. Um, they're all they're all pe retired people. I was I was a teenager. They were retired. The leader of the group was in his eighties, um, and he was he'd been he, he played in the Liverpool Philharmonic before the war, before going on to have a very successful career as a dentist. Um, and he he would always try new things. And this late string quintet by Max Brook in A major was discovered. Um, a minor, A major, was discovered only, I think, in the 1990s, published only in the 1990s. He wrote it at the end of his life, after the First World War, and he's a very sad, very lonely, very unhappy man. And this string quintet, um, it's just, it just drips with nostalgia and lyricism. It's clearly the work of the man who wrote that violin concerto. It has all that violinistic sort of lyricism. It has a kind of gypsy finale, again, but somehow charged with this sweetness and sadness and poetry. He's a composer in the Brahms tradition, writing after the First World War, and 
he hasn't you know he doesn't he's true to himself and he, the piece has enormous warmth and enormous beauty i think it might be having listened to most of his chain music i think it's probably his single finest chamber work um it doesn't involve a clarinet anyway um so it's max brooks um, a major string quintet um very very underrated mm. very neglected and um just a piece I, I have a very 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 soft spot in my heart as always richard opening up the repertoire to me every single week amazing like everybody does um just before we come to your last choice, Andrew, um, I just want to uh, go over some of the other choices that we came to, uh, uh, we, we were given on Facebook, because uh, there were some really, really great uh, suggestions. We've got Mozart, uh, K515, Schumann, we mentioned Shostakovich, we mentioned Nielsen, Wind Quintet, uh, which Philip Henscher says is uh, sublime. Uh, Matthew Trigg uh, wanted the Shostakovich, uh, the Foray, Mozart G minor, Brahms F minor. Um, uh, as James Webb, uh, who's also a composer, says, both are some of the best music by each composer. Uh, what have we got here? Leon Bosch, who's a, a bass player, uh, has unsurprisingly chosen the the uh, Trout as his number one, uh, but also <laughs> Vorjak, Brahms, Schubert, um, Prokofiev quintet, uh, he hasn't been mentioned. Doc Nani uh, piano quintet, uh, mentioned by Christian Thompson, uh, as well as the Elgar, lots of Mozart, lots of Foray mentioned. And one I want to throw in, which was mentioned by a few people, is Ligeti, and that is the 10 pieces. He, he did write a uh, a, a quintet as well, wing quintet as well, but uh, the 10 pieces for wing quintet I think are fabulous pieces. Little, 10 little bursts of music of varying speeds. Uh, this is from his period where he was sort of transitioning from what he was famous for, which are those big blocks of, of sound and textures that I've talked about before in Loxeterna and the Requiem and things like that. Those sort of heavy, slow moving textures. And he's going to a, that he's got that in there with the with the wind quintet but also he's got these more distinct melodic lines coming coming through these little bursts of of energy which are fabulous to listen to i really love the fact there's a quote at the end from through the looking glass which i think is is pure ligety and sort of says everything you need to know about the piece it says, it's but and there was a long pause is that all alice timidly asked that's all said humpty dumpty goodbye that's it. I thought that's very playful, very ligety, and yeah. uh, says everything you need to know about that piece. But a, a terrific set of, t of ten pieces uh, to do. So I definitely wanted to throw that in. Andrew, your last choice. I hope it's a single choice rather than a whole group of pieces. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know what? No, it isn't. <laughs> oh. um, it's kind. Of, it's kind of a single choice, but. Um, I mean, Richard's been mentioning it uh, throughout the, the, the our entire conversation, but it, 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 for me, it's the Mozart, you know, two viola quintets, um, and it, it, I'm I'm trying to, you know, really talk, you know, think about why why I think these pieces are so special, <clears throat> and now I've I've have some distance from um, my career as a quartet player. Um, I mean, I still play lots of chamber music, but I'm not in a, a full-time quartet. I, it's amazing how quickly Mozart's quartets can disappear from conversations, from consciousness. You know, people talk about the Beethoven quartets, the Shostakovich quartets or something, but, you know, as a as a cycle, his quartets are never played because the early ones are kind of a little bit immature, and then the late ones, actually, they're just really, really hard. Um, <laughs> and they're quite difficult to listen to. I'm not sure that when people hear those late quartets that they really get them. I'm not sure I get them. You know, they're, they're, they're fabulous pieces, but they're, they, they take some listening to it and some understanding. But when you add just one more viola to, to, to Mozart's imagination, uh, as I was saying earlier, it frees up every possibility. The, the, the music becomes less personal, perhaps, and a little bit more public. Um, but it makes the rich, the, the harmonies richer in the accompaniment. If there's one solo voice, you have a bass line, three people accompanying with really rich harmonies and, and a, a soloist, a singer over the top. And you can have any number of duets going on, um, uh, with people to spare, to fill out the texture. So everything it's easy to write for, and it just, it, the imagination comes flowing. And I don't know if I'm talking about K515 or K516, the C major or the G minor. Um, two of the most extraordinary pieces of music that you can participate in with five people. I mean, the, 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 if you if you're in a, a tragic Don Giovanni mood, then there's there's only one piece. You know that the G minor quintet is 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 unsurpassed for for, for me. I I'm 
I'm not somebody who, who uh, actually, I mean, I, I, of course I love Mozart, but I'm, he's not one of my very favorite composers. There are certain pieces for me that really speak. Um, and it's these two quintets are at the very, very top um, of, of his output for me. Uh, to, to play, to listen to, the C major quintet is the most joyous opera for five people, for five instrumentalists, not for five... You know, uh, it, it's it's the, the drama of being an instrumentalist. If you if you if you can imagine an opera that's about that, you know, um, and the joy of it uh, is it's something. And also, I just we don't get to play them nearly often enough, and don't get to listen to them nearly often enough. And um, I'm looking. I'm doing five on five in a couple of weeks' time, and I can't wait. <sighs> Andrew, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I think people are going to be horrified by how lenient we've been with you uh, in your choices. With, oh, well, thank with, um, you. <laughs> choosing an entire series of, entire. Uh, of quintets <laughs> by lots of different composers and then and then not even managing to choose just one of the Mozarts at the end. One of but, them. Uh, but uh, either uh, way, it's, been, <laughs> it's, either it's one. been fabulous. Either one can go at the top. <laughs> thank you. It's <laughs> been good. a great thank pleasure you so much. Um, to be. It's, been, it's the very been the very beginning of our day and the very end of your day uh, such is the time difference between us and uh, and sydney yes. australia but i wish you all wish you uh great success with it it's so great to hear that you're that you're working so much and we're just hoping that we're all going to be able to manage to do that here too do you know when Absolutely. you might make it I, back to the I, uk at any point it all depends on the quarantine laws mm. i'm hoping to come this year but uh if I have to spend five weeks in quarantine to to work for three days, it's not going to happen, you know. Uh, no, indeed um, not. But I, you know, there are, I, there, there are the plans in the diary, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we we'll look forward to seeing you here when, whenever that is. Thanks again, uh, Andrew, and thanks as always to Richard and Charlotte. If you enjoyed the Classical Top 5, please do consider making a donation. Uh, details are always in the summaries of each of our podcasts. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at Classical Top 5. On Facebook, we have a page, The Classical Top 5. Just search for that. And if you'd like to email us, because we always like to hear from you, please do. Classical Top 5 at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.